Let's look at Romans chapter 12, and let's begin in verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that we have the privilege of being able to study your word together as a family, Lord. We're so grateful that um, you love it when we're in your word. You love it when we're worshiping in any capacity. And Lord, as we are um, standing before you and, and, and being able to express to you that we want to learn from you, Lord, would you help us to learn everything that we're supposed to learn, but not just learn for the sake of learning, but Lord, would you speak to us anything that we need to change in our lives, Lord, by your Holy Spirit? Lord, we know that you're working in our lives to make us more like Jesus, Lord, and sometimes um, we don't want to hear what you have to say. Uh, or it's uncomfortable to be convicted, and we want we welcome that t- today. We welcome you, your conviction. We're so grateful that we can be convicted, and we can repent, and we can turn back to you. We pray that you would help us to um, be made more like Jesus as a result of these verses, and thank you that we get to study together in unity. We pray, Lord, that you would be glorified through us studying your word. Thank you, Jesus, that you said if we continue in your word, we're your disciples indeed. We're grateful for that, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, the book of Romans, um, how many of you have you studied the book of Romans? Well, that's a lot. I remember the first time I ever taught the book of Romans, and I was pretty nervous. It was very intimidating to teach the book of Romans. When I was studying, I'm like, Oh, God, help me to make it clearer than what it is right now in my head. You know, it's like, as they say, what's, what's uh, misty in the pulpit is foggy in the pews. You know, and so if it's not clear to you, the one that's trying to teach, it's definitely not going to be clear to anybody else. And I remember just going, man, this is so deep. And, and, I'm, and you know, sometimes I, I, I read the scriptures and I forget I'm reading the scriptures. I'm like, whoa, that's biblical. <laughs> you know, look at that wow, that's so right on. I'm like, oh yeah, it's the Bible. You know, makes sense. Uh, but Romans is so full of so many rich themes and, and so much amazing truth. But if you studied it, you know that it's all about the preeminence of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how amazing that gospel is. You know, uh, if you've studied the, the book of Romans, you know that Paul likely didn't plant the church of Rome. And it was likely planted by the Jews that went to the Feast of Pentecost. And Acts chapter 2 heard uh, Peter stand up and preach the gospel. And then they went back to Rome and planted a church. Didn't even wait for the Apostle Paul. Uh, Didn't even wait for him to get saved or all these things. They just went and started basically sharing the gospel and and started um, helping people understand that Jesus was and is the Messiah, and there was a group of people that wanted to gather in his name, and so they started doing that. <clears throat> so it's all about this amazing gospel that reveals God's plan of redemption and how amazing that plan of redemption is. And, and all this is about righteousness. It's all about us being able to secure the righteousness that God approves. And the folly that we engage in before we come to know the Lord sometimes is thinking that we can have a righteousness that will actually be sufficient to appease God and the requirements that he has. The problem is we learn that the standard is perfection. And if you've ever been less than perfect, then you don't qualify. And you are a sinner, which qualifies you as a sinner, being less than perfect. And you need saving. You need, um, you need to be forgiven. And so um, the law of Moses was never intended as a means by which we get righteousness in the sense of being able to be approved by God and go to heaven or have eternal life. The Hebrew word kafar in Hebrew means to cover. It never meant to remove, permanently 
remove. And so the, the sins were covered until the Messiah came and took all the sins of mankind on himself. Um, past sins, current, present tense, that time, future sins, all sins that man has committed were paid for by Jesus on the cross all at once. The prophet Isaiah describes what Jesus went through or the fact that there, the Messiah would be a suffering servant and would die in our place in the book of Isaiah, written 740 years before the birth of Christ, where we're told this, <clears throat> he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. We did not esteem him. Surely has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, the Jews today, when they read that, they will say that the suffering servant is either Isaiah himself or the Jewish people. They've been the suffering servant all through their existence and everything. The problem is that when you're dying for someone, you need to be sinless. And the very prophet Isaiah himself said at the beginning of the book, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. So Isaiah himself says he's disqualified to die in anyone's place. And he says that the people are disqualified to die in anyone's place. The only one qualified to die in anyone's place is the Lord Jesus. And he, and he did that. And the message of that, you know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that the gospel is Christ died according to the scriptures, was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says it's the, the gospel is the power of God into salvation for those who believe. So that's the power. So when we're wanting to be faithful to communicate the means by which someone secures eternal life, we have to preach that gospel. And Jesus said in Matthew 28, he told us to, to be able to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all the things I've commanded you. So he's given us this, this great commission of being faithful to preaching the gospel to people and having them get saved. The problem is sometimes we think that it's our responsibility for them to have the right response. But God doesn't say that. He never says that it's our responsibility. You know, I've said this many times, but the mail carrier, can't say mailman anymore, but the mail carrier doesn't get stressed out if I don't pay my bills, doesn't think it's a reflection on them if I don't pay my bills. Their whole job is just to deliver the mail. That's what God's called us to in terms of preaching the gospel. He's called us to, to communicate the message and leave the results to God because it's between them and the Holy Spirit. That should take in a massive, enormous pressure off our shoulders it, and because we're not responsible for the result. And there's nothing wrong with the harvest field. Sometimes we criticize the harvest field. If I go to pastor's conferences and I, I meet pastors from all over the world, you know, or at least in the country, and they'll say, oh, it's hard ground where I'm at. It's hard ground. You know, I'm like, how come everyone says that? You know, the, 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 yes, it's hard ground. But Jesus said that the harvest is ripe. He said that, that it's ready for harvest. That's his assessment. I need to repeat that. It's his assessment. It's the only assessment that matters is his assessment. Nobody goes into a, 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 an orchard that's that's during harvest time and is surprised by ripe fruit that's ready to be plucked. Why? Because it's harvest time. So why are we surprised every time someone has a positive response to the gospel? It's because we don't believe that Jesus said it's ripe and it's ready. Will every single person receive? No. And they didn't, they didn't receive Jesus' message. They didn't receive the apostle Paul or the apostles. It was, I mean, there's all different reactions, but in general, the harvest is ripe and it's ready for harvest. The outline of the book of Romans in chapters 1 through 11 leading up to where we're at this morning is that 
There's a greeting, there's thanksgiving, and the theme of the letter communicated in chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Then the revelation of the wrath of God in chapter 1, verse 18 through chapter 3, verse 20. Then the revelation of the righteousness of God in chapter 3, verses 21 through chapter 4, verse 25. The new life in Christ is articulated in chapter 5, verses 1 through 8 and 39. And then Israel's uh, is in God's plan in chapter 9, verses uh, 1 through chapter 11 through 36. So, so that leads us to chapter 12. And I'm just saying that for context because it's going to matter when we get into our verses because of the fact that there's a major division in chapter 12. So chapters 12 through 16 constitute a major division in the book. So chapters 1 through 11 talks about this amazing gospel or means by which we come to know Christ. But chapters 12 through 16 get into the practical, gets into the, how, the nitty-gritty, how, how we should respond to this great plan of salvation, this great gospel, because the Christian life is a response. It's not, it's not something that we initiate and then God responds. It's, it's something that He's initiated and we respond. And the whole Christian life is, a, a, you could call it the great response, great response to God's love, the great response to God's provision, the great response to God's salvation. You could just go on and on and on. That's what worship is. It's, a, it's an appropriate response to something that God has done. So we first need to see that the beginning of this verse and the beginning of this, this section, chapters 12 through 16, is a response or how we should properly respond to what he's just been saying in the previous 11 chapters. And we see that in verse 1 by the word therefore. He says therefore. And we should always ask what the therefore is there for. Very common, you know. Hey, I get deep when these things, you know. What's the therefore there for? The Apostle Paul is saying in light of all that you've received by appropriating this amazing gospel, I'm asking you to do something now. In fact, Paul is doing is, is more than asking; he's begging. He's um, we see that in the word beseech there in verse one. Did you see that beseech? How many of you say beseech on a regular basis? I hope not. Don't admit that. I beseech you. You know, we talked about uh, what was the other word that we did um, that I put my hands on my hips and oh, behold. You know, we don't use that anymore. But we don't use beseech. But it's really talking about imploring you carefully please i'm asking i'm i'm not begging really or you could say it's begging like i beg you please but it's 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 something that is he's imploring them he's going all the way up to the line of saying i'm commanding you but he can't command he's not commanding this <clears throat> he's highly 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 suggesting versus commanding well, why isn't he commanding because this is something that's volitional that he's going to ask them or implore them to do. It's something that has to do with the response to what God's already done. Because this whole section is about responding to what God's already done with the gospel and through the gospel. So it has to be volitional, it has to be their choice, it has to be a response that is full of worship. You remember burnt offerings in the Old Testament? We just studied that uh, on Thursday nights when we went through the Leviticus. We went through all the different offerings, which is beautiful. They all point to Christ. They're all necessary. Um, and we saw the burnt offering. The old joke is, it's not your wife's cooking, okay? I didn't say that. That's someone else said that, you know. But yeah, men, if your wife cooks for you, don't ever call her food that she cooks, if you want to stay married, um, a burnt offering. Um, it's something much different. Um, but this was something, these burnt offerings were not, they were not commanded, but rather offered. They were offered as an option for people. Burnt offerings were a volitional offering, an offering of consecration. And I love that God made provision for people to express that they wanted to be consecrated to God and wanted to commune with Him and fellowship with Him and show that they were serious about their relationship with him. It is an expression of worship that you wanted to be consecrated to him. And thus the whole animal was consumed, symbolizing my life being consecrated and consumed for God. And I believe that's what the Apostle Paul is thinking about here, at least in part here. He's talking about um, 
surrender. He's talking about completely being consumed by God and being consecrated to Him. So he says there, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So he's saying, I beseech you, I beg you, please, in light of chapters 1 through 11, in light of everything that we've covered about how amazing the gospel is and God's plan of salvation, he, he, he says, I beg you, please, to do this. And you're going to do it by, it says, the mercies of God. You may have heard this, but I like reminding myself and reminding everyone else that grace is getting something good that you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting something bad that you do deserve. And, you know, we're, we see grace and peace be Paul's greeting in all these letters. And I love the fact that in the pastoral epistles, he adds mercy. Because I can relate to that. I need God's mercy there. And so he's saying by the mercies of God to do what he's asking them to do, what, he, what he's going to implore them to do here. And so, you know, he's talking about the fact that God wants to extend mercy to you, and, and, and he does extend mercy to you if you're a Christian, that he, is, he has spared you from taking the punishment for your sins, because Jesus took the punishment for our sins, and so that means we're not going to take the punishment for our sins anymore. He's removed that from us as believers. And then he says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now imagine you living in Old Testament times. Can you think about that for a second? You live, you're, you know, you're Jewish, you're, you're in you're have different tribes you're a part of. Um, you know, I mean, all of us would be in different tribes, I'm saying, but you're, you're there and you, you've heard about these burnt offerings and you want to present a burnt offering to the Lord. So you bring your animal to the priest and you say, I want to present this as a burnt offering, you know, and then all of a sudden you change your mind and say, wait a minute, no, I want to be the burnt offering. <laughs> you know, I want to be burned up. You know, the priest would not let you, and, and that's not how what God prescribed. And, and he'd probably think that you, you know, you need medical attention or some kind of help uh, thinking that. But that would be so strange. You know, you go up to this tabernacle, which is 45 feet long, 15 feet wide, 15 feet high. It's not very big. This room is pretty much bigger than, for sure, it's wider than 15 feet. Um, and, and you're there presenting your, your burnt offering to the Lord there, and you want to consecrate yourself to the Lord. You want to uh, express that. Um, and so he's saying, um, you know, he's saying that you, you, we can do that. You can bring this offering. You can consecrate yourself to the Lord. We can do that for you if you'd like. We're not doing you personally, but we'll do this animal, and, and that would be totally fine. There's, there's, there's really the idea here of being a willing sacrifice, being a willing sacrifice, a will, someone that is volitionally wanting to commune with God and con be consecrated to God, and that's why it can't be forced. That's why the Apostle Paul can't command it, because it's worship. If someone commands you to worship and you did that, you wouldn't be really worshiping, because worship needs to be an expression of your heart and an expression of your will to God. I've, I've been in worship services where the worship leader is commanding people. It's like, look, if, and Pastor Chuck used to talk about this, if this is already happening between you and the Lord, no one up front's going to get you to do something that you're not prepared in your heart to do. It has to be something that is a result of what his work has been in your life. <clears throat> so he's not commanding, and Paul isn't afraid to command. He's going to do it in the next verse. Trust me, the Apostle Paul was not afraid to command things and use his apostolic authority and leadership uh, role to command things. So he's not unwilling at all, but it has to be volitional, just like the burnt offering was. There's two famous or well-known examples in the scriptures of living sacrifices. The first one is Isaac. And Isaac was had to go along with Abram's plan to sacrifice him. He could have fought back. He wasn't you know, a seven-year-old as sometimes you see in these paintings and things like that, he was older, and, and so he had to go along with it. Uh, Abram was old by that time, and so I'm sure he could have overpowered him. So Isaac had to be a living sacrifice in the sense of being willing. But the ultimate example is the Lord Jesus. 
being a willing sacrifice. And we've seen it as we've gone through the Gospel of John. He could have gotten out of things at any, any moment <clears throat> if he chose to, but he didn't. He accepted the Father's cup, he accepted his portion, and, and he was not, he didn't, no one took his life, he laid it down, he makes that clear in Scripture, and, you know, he gave up his spirit. You know, we're going to get to that when we get to seeing Jesus on the cross. He gave up his spirit. He didn't, nothing was taken from the Lord Jesus on the cross. He offered it, and that's a beautiful um, expression of love for us. <clears throat> so we are called to present our bodies. Look at that word present there. That's kind of like a worship way of saying to, 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 with our bodies to, to say, look, surrender. I'm surrendering my life, my body, everything in me, I'm surrendering to God. And he says that's our reasonable service. And that again, the word service there gives us a hint that he's thinking of kind of like a priestly format or way that, that's involved in the, 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 um, the formal offerings and everything. I think thinking of a burnt offering there, but he's talking about um, worship there because the, whole, the priesthood and what they allowed the people to do was, in, it was engaging and leading them in worship. So I believe he's describing this here. And lastly, he says, holy and acceptable to God. You know, sometimes there's a flippancy related to holiness in the church where people don't take it very seriously and, and they're not thinking about personal holiness. And I think that that's sad that that's happening in um, a lot of places in, in, the, in the church today where we don't really care about watching what we say, what we do, how we handle things, what, how we treat people, our motivation for things, and we are kind of have this flippancy and, and, and we're just not taking it seriously. But he, but he says here, we, he wants us to present our bodies holy and acceptable to God. It matters to God, what we do, what we say, all these things, it matters to him. And he wants us to take it very seriously. You know, when you first receive Christ, you start taking inventory with the Lord and saying, okay, is this, is this what, you know, what I'm doing here? Is that against God's word? Is it pleasing to you? Is it getting in the way of me doing something else for you? You start doing all that with the Holy Spirit. He starts working on you and dealing with you about things. Yeah, and you know, we're aware of so much just in the very beginning. You know, there's so many things we're aware of, but, but as time goes by, <clears throat> sometimes he reveals things that you didn't expect him to, re to reveal. Like, yeah, that, that's, that's not pleasing to me. You're like, whoa, I didn't realize that, you know, um, I didn't, I didn't realize that that was something that was a big deal. And, you know, and he's so faithful to deal with us and convict us and show us that's not pleasing to me. And we should really care about what pleases God in our lives. We should really, it should matter immensely what we're engaged in, what, you know, what we're watching, you know, what, who we're around, what, what we do with the no one's looking, all these things that should, churches don't talk about that as much anymore. You know, they need to, they need to, if we're talking about being made into disciples, disciple making process, that has a lot to do with, with holiness, it has a lot to do with taking holiness seriously and not making excuses for it and not, um, you know, downgrading these things to, oh, they're not really, that's not sin, that's just mistakes, or that's, you know, all these things. We do this mental gymnastics to try to justify and make ourselves feel better about ourselves. But it's really anything that's not in alignment with God's will for us. You know, we wasted a lot of time before we came to know Christ, wasting our, our lives on worthless things, on, on things that weren't worth our time, just not only were they temporal, but they just weren't, they didn't build us up. They didn't, they didn't, or they were, they caused us to be in bondage. You know, we we're addicted to things and there's an, enough of that. There's enough of that. We don't need any more of that going on in, in our lives. And, you know, it's really helpful for us to, when we're in God's word, just have an open heart because sometimes we don't even know our own hearts. You know, David talked about that. David talked about you know, Lord, if there's anything I'm, you know, I need to be aware of, show me, you know, just like my heart's bare before you and just being open and honest with, with him. And he's faithful to do it. You know, I remember the first time I really got, I was walking through this kind of dates me, of course, but blockbuster video when I was a new Christian, you know, I'm walking through there and I'm looking at these, these covers, you know, and, uh, 
I'm like, oh yeah, I want to see that. And he's like, that's not for you. I'm like, whoa, that was, that was really clear. I didn't expect that. That's not for me, you know. Vacation three or whatever, with Chevy Chase or whatever it was, you know, that's not for you. And I'm like, wow, you know, that's, that was very specific, you know. And Paul talks about that in Romans where he talks about the law of the Spirit, you know, that the law of the Spirit shows me and gives me the, 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 the capacity to understand what's pleasing for me and what's, what's he wants for my life. Don't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit in a new believer's life to show them what's not pleasing to him because he will show them just like he shows us. He doesn't love us more than he loves them and he doesn't want their life to be free from all this stuff. And, you know, sometimes people come to me and they're like, I don't know why my life and my mind is full of all this garbage and I can't stop thinking about all these sinful things. Then I start asking him, the intake questions. What are you intaking? What are you taking in? What movies are you watching? What shows are you watching? And it becomes evident that they're filling their mind with a bunch of garbage, and then they wonder why they're struggling with their thought life. You can't have a bunch of things that aren't of God, and you're taking those things in and have it not affect your walk. And sometimes when you talk about those things, people say you're being legalistic, but there's principles from God's word that are clear about those things that are not pleasing to, to, to God. And, and so we need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit with all of that. So this is, a, this is a thing where he's saying, present your body a living sacrifice, a volitional sacrifice, holy and acceptable to me, you know, and, and take it seriously. Now, we can't be holy and grow in Christ's likeness in our own strength. Now, that's an effort and an exercise in futility for sure, because we don't have it in ourselves to do that. That's a big mistake. So sometimes people get really serious about living more holy, but they don't use the Lord and all the resources that are available to us in the, with the Holy Spirit or His Word or prayer, or all these things that He gives us, and they try to do it in their own strength and roll up their sleeves, so to speak, and just try harder. That's not the victorious Christian life that He lays out in Scripture. That is, that is, you know, Jesus would say to us, apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, quit trying to be holy in your, in your flesh. You're not, it's not going to happen. That's why uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to, to the Galatians and said, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not gratify or fulfill the lusts of the flesh. It's, we think it's the opposite. I got to stop sinning to walk in the Spirit. He says, walk in the Spirit and you'll stop sinning. We get it all backwards. Just like, well, if I, if I do enough good things, then I'll, I'll believe who he says I am in Christ and I'll be able to walk in that. No, he says, believe who he says you are in Christ and walk in that. And then all these other things will be taken care of. It's the opposite of what we might expect. So that's what God wants for us. We're all growing in that, myself included, but he wants us to be growing in that. Now, in verse two, he looks, he gets to the command. Look with me in verse two, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he says, do not be conformed to this world. Now that do not be conformed is one word in the Greek. And the ending is that they, they have this ending called the imperative ending or imperative mood ending, which reveals that it's a command. We have to see, you kind of have to change our tone of voice or yell to communicate that something's a command. I mean, I could say, don't eat pizza. And they're like, okay, well, that's, that's like a suggestion. But I say, don't eat pizza. Then they're like, oh, he's commanding me to not eat pizza. By the way, I had pizza last night. That's why I'm talking about it. Um, but so, you know, it's this command, do not be conformed to this world. The, world, the, the word conform there means to be patterned after its mold. The world and the spirit of the world is trying to pattern us in its mold. And we have to consciously refuse. First of all, we have to acknowledge that it's trying to do that. Number two, we need to recognize that there is a pattern, there is a mold, and if we, we don't have to try very hard or, or work towards um, allowing it to do that, it'll just naturally do that. Again, another reason to be careful what intake we have related to things that are going to affect things in our lives. So he, does, he doesn't want us patterned after the mold of this world. The world is self-consumed and evil. The, I'm talking about unregenerate man, unbelievers living just for their own lives, 
and the, the whole, all the philosophies and things and agendas and everything, those things are evil. Those things will affect us. And we can let it affect us by not recognizing that those things are not of God. We can just, and we, and we can be defeated by all these things that feel like they're so strong and so um, stronger than anything else that's happening. You know, if we, we, I always see, I see this and I have to fight against it in my own heart. When I see the way that this country's going or how Europe's going and, and related to Christianity, and we can get discouraged even though we don't see all that God's doing and God is doing a lot, especially in young people right now. And, and so we can think that the, everything's happening in the whole world like it's happening in America and Europe. When South America, China, Iran, um, all these countries are just, the, God just pouring out his spirit and people are getting saved like crazy all over the world. And the, the news doesn't report that. So we can allow what's, what we see to kind of feel defeated when Jesus said that in Matthew 18, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Because the Lord's building the church, he's taking us forward and there's nothing that's going to get in the way of, of the church moving forward. It's not going out of existence. It's not defeated. It's, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit, you know, lost its saltiness. You know, it's, it's not as effective in the, in the moment, partly because of compromise and because of people not teaching God's word and people not growing and the whole philosophy of ministry behind, you know, churches that gather and the whole, their whole purpose is to make people, good people better instead of lost people saved. And, you know, they're, they're adding all this self-help jargon and everything to, instead of teaching God's word. And so people are wanting success principles and the biggest churches in America, you know, don't want to say, don't want to talk about sin and repentance. They're just talking about life improvement. And of course that gets the crowds uh, and everything, but, you know, we're called to stand against evil and, and, and speak the truth and, and be um, aligned with what God says, because God's going to judge this world. There's going to be a great tribulation that's going to happen. He's going to pour out his wrath on this world, and he's going to judge this world in, in a very powerful way. So Paul says, be transformed there in verse 2, but be transformed. So he commands us to not be patterned after the world's mold, that's the literal language, but be transformed. And that's our word metamorphosis. It means to change form. I remember, I may have said this once or twice, but I remember in the 70s, I know I'm just talking about the 70s, but I was into watching TV as a kid. And I remember when I see someone likes that, the fact that I was, I was wasting my time. But I remember seeing this green guy well, I wasn't, didn't start out a green guy. He started out a regular guy. And then all of a sudden his eyes would go cra- like turn like this color. And all of a sudden he would turn into this Hulk guy. Bill Bixby would turn into the incredible Hulk. And I remember in the beginning of that show that they talked about this metamorphosis that happened. Like, what is that word metamorphosis? And I realized, and I learned that that's like changing form. And I learned about uh, caterpillars turning into butterflies and tadpoles turning into frogs. When I got into school, I'm like, that's like the incredible Hulk. They're doing what the Hulk does. And they're like, okay, just pay attention. Don't get sidetracked into all these things. And, uh, but then as I started studying this word and studying scripture, I learned that there's three main characteristics for metamorphosis. And that is that the change originates from within. Secondly, the change is substantial. It's a big change. And then third, the change is superior to the previous form. And I want to give you a biblical example. The transfiguration, when Jesus changed form there, and, and uh, Peter, James, and John were, were, got to see this happen. And when, they, when he was with uh, Moses and Elijah there, his change originated from within. There was nothing from without on the outside making Jesus change forms. He did that from within. The change was substantial. Then their description of it is just unbelievable what they what they saw with this change of form. And then the change was superior. That 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 glory that he revealed to the disciples was superior to his previous form. But you know what's exciting is that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, we're told that we're going through a metamorphosis. We are going through a metamorphosis. He's changing us. 
Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, that's our word metamorphosis, into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So it's our word again. We're being transformed. The same three characteristics are, are relevant. In a, so the, we're changed from glory to glory. The change is um, happening from within. Because he says in the verse, it's from the Holy Spirit, who's within us. No, there's no outward anything, catalyst, that's affecting this change and making us more and more like Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit inside of us that's doing it. The change is substantial because he's making us more like Jesus, radically more and more like Jesus. And then also it's, it's superior because being like Jesus is way more uh, superior than how we are in ourselves. And so there's this process of being changed from glory to glory by the Holy Spirit. So we're going through this metamorphosis and it's going to culminate with us being transformed into our new bodies. That's where all this is going. We're going to be transformed, whether it's at the rapture. Well, either way, it's going to be at the rapture. So the Holy Spirit's going to transform our bodies at the rapture. If we're dead at the time of the rapture, he's going to, the Holy Spirit's going to transform us. We're going to get our new bodies, and it will be reuniting, reuniting our bodies with our spirits that's already with Jesus. If we're alive at that time, Paul wrote to the church of, of, of Rome in Romans 8.11, he said, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he will likewise raise your bodies to life. So he's going to raise us to life. So we're going to be transformed. So that's the word transformed. But he gets into a little bit different of a usage. He says that be transformed by what? You see in the middle of verse 2 there? By the renewing of your mind. So when we get saved, when we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us when we're born again, our minds don't automatically become more godly. I don't know if you noticed that. But your, your mind isn't renewed at that moment. I wish it were, but it's not. And there's a reason why God has chosen, because he could have done that. We could have got saved. We pray in Jesus' name, we get saved, boom, our minds are renewed. And it's been like as if we've been walking with the Lord for 30 years and knowledge of God's word. But there wouldn't be this, this joy of discovery of his word and growing in his word and having us change, having him change us from the inside out and this transformation by the word of God. But God has chosen to do it through his word. That's why it's so important for us to feast on this, to have our minds renewed by his word. And this is why it's been under attack since the very beginning, since the Garden of Eden. Has God said? He said that to them. He's always casting doubt on his word. And, and this is the thing that will transform us the most related to being um, you know, transformed from the inside out is his word. Being conformed by the world has to do with our thinking and our attitudes and how we see things. The natural mind doesn't know the things of the Spirit and, we can't, and can't receive them because they are spiritually discerned, we're told in Romans. So he wants us to conform us to him, but we have to have our minds renewed. I've talked to so many people that have described what it was like to first receive Christ and then how when they started reading God's word and not just for head knowledge, but to really commune with him and really know the truth and value the truth and how God started renewing their minds and cleaning up their minds, you know, and that takes, you know, in the beginning, it's kind of a challenge because, and I heard this example before, it's like, you know, when you're shopping with a toddler, you know, and they keep throwing things in the basket that you're not asking for. And if you're not paying attention, you're going to get to that checkout and you're going to be like, what? I can't believe you put all these things in here. I don't want these things. That's kind of how it's like for the Christian. You have these thoughts that come in. We didn't ask for them. And then we have to decide at that moment whether or not we're going to allow them to stay or we're going to put them back on the shelf. So that doesn't please God. That's not for me to have in my mind. And then I'm going to reject it. And I'm going to replace it with scripture, replace it with all the things that are of good report and lovely and, and beautiful and all the things that are of God, because God wants to do that. He wants to renew our minds. That's why at Calvary Chapel and other healthy churches, we put such an emphasis on the teaching of God's word, because that's, that's what transforms us. I remember when I first came to Calvary Chapel in 1995, I, I had been a Christian for five years. 
And they had a tape library. I know it's funny, tapes. At least they weren't eight, eight tracks. Okay? But if they were eight tracks, I would be admitting it. But they, it was a little bit later. And I just checked out as many tapes as I could. And you're only allowed to take, to take four tapes a week. I was done with four tapes in, on the end of Monday. I was really motivated. I was really hungry to learn. Because he was teaching, my pastor was teaching things in context. And I understood God's word in a way I'd never underst- understood them before. I'm like, oh, I, now I know what Jesus was saying. Because I look at the context and I can see and I can understand. And I started just like, I want to know the whole Bible. And I would just go through it. That's why I talk to people so much about these apps that, that have Pastor Chuck teaching from Genesis to Revelation and just bombarding yourself with God's word and learning God's word. And it's a beautiful thing. And then I would, uh, so I grew more in the first six months than I had the previous five years because I was getting up to 20 to 25 tapes a week because I would come in during the week. They're, they're like, this kid's driving us crazy. We need to just accommodate him. So I just come in, I would take whatever tapes I want, check them back out, little index cards, you know, you're writing down what you're checking out, all this stuff, procedure, whatever. I'm doing, I'll do what you want me to do. I just want these tapes. And uh, so... I um, checked these tapes out, and I grew so much, and, and I just loved that. And I'd see people come in that weren't, didn't want to devour God's Word. They didn't want to grow in His Word, and they would just be waiting for, like, what's the big deal? Why are people talking about this church? It's, it's just you know, because if you're not interested in growing, you're not interested in learning, not just for learning's sake, but just to be more like Jesus, you're not going to be happy in a Bible-teaching church. It's convicting. When you want success principles and prosperity principles to make you feel better about yourself, but you're not, they're not going through Scripture and Scripture's not convicting you and things, you know, because if you're not wanting to grow, you're not going to last. I've seen it for 30-something years. People don't last because they don't want to really grow. They don't want to be convicted and dealt with and all that. And, it, and I remember reading the, the parable of the soils for the first time after I understood this. And I remember going, okay, that's the key because Jesus said that the seed is the word of God. And he said, if you don't understand this parable, by the way, you can't understand any of the parables. And so he says, the seed is the word of God. And what, what causes the explosion of growth? It's when the seed, the word of God, is connected with a heart, the right heart. When you have the right heart and you connect it with the word of God, exponential growth happens. That's, why, that's what he says is the, the way that we grow because your mind gets renewed because you start thinking God's thoughts in a sense. You start understanding how to test scripture. You start getting a, you know, it's been said that sin will keep you from this book and this book will keep you from sin. And it's also been said, the more you hunger for this book, the more you'll hunger for this book. You know, it's just amazing how it, you, you know, Pastor Chuck used to tell us in class, he'd say, you know, fellas, sheep hunger for what you feed them. Don't just give them the sweets. Give them the meat and potatoes. You know, his generation, meat and potatoes was the ultimate health food expression, I guess. I don't know. But give them the meat and potatoes. Don't just give them the sweets. You know, that's why it's a protection for you to go through all of the scriptures and go to a church that teaches all of the scriptures because you get the, the content and the proportion in which it was revealed. So I can't go, you know what? I'm really into this doctrine, and that's all I ever talk about. I have to go through the whole scriptures. So I have to cover the things that are not as exciting or I'd rather not teach, you know, or maybe I would avoid because it's just, it's harder, you know. Um, But I don't have that luxury, and it's not a luxury because all scripture is given by inspiration of God, all. Leviticus, Deuteronomy, all the ones that Preachers make fun of, don't worry, we won't be in Leviticus. Don't, you know, like, are you crazy? You know how amazing Leviticus is? You know how much it points to Jesus? You know, I mean, I could go on and on and on how amazing it is and what we learn from that. There's every single book of every every part of the Bible is amazing and is profitable and has a purpose. And the more we're in it, the more we'll hunger to be in it. And that's something that I would encourage all of us, and I'm talking to me too, to grow in, in terms of being in his word. You know, People ask, how, how many hours a week do you study for Sunday? And I'm like, well, it just depends, you know, um, how much time I have, what the passage is. But I'm telling you, what's the hardest part about preparing a sermon is what to keep in. Because I have to take stuff out. There's so much stuff that I've learned. I've been the first recipient. And I'm like, I can't fit all this in. I, they already go too long, you know. 
Remember these, these, these stopwatches, what they mean? They mean nothing. You know, that's, that's what they mean. They mean nothing. But I try to have mercy on you. I don't want to go for an hour and a half or three hours or whatever. I have to cut stuff out because God's word is such, so amazing. And so I love the fact that he says you'll be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Now, we're also told at the end of verse two that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what does that mean? Does it mean that my mind's renewed and now I know God's will? Yes, you'll be more apt to know God's will because his will is his word and his word is his will in context. But also what it's really getting at, I believe, is that as we live these things out, as we obey God's word and he changes us because our minds are being renewed and now our lives are looking different, our lives confirm the wisdom of this book. Jesus said wisdom is justified by her children. That means that the people that have been under the tutelage of wisdom demonstrate that wisdom is as amazing as wisdom is. And God puts a high premium on wisdom in his word, especially in Proverbs. So as we live out God's word and we align our lives with his word being transformed in that way, then we demonstrate that God's will is the, great, is the greatest will that can ever be. And living that life is an amazing life. And we glorify God in that way. I believe that's what he's saying in part there. And um, we prove it out. It's, that's another way of saying it, that, what is, that you may prove out what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now let's close in verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So this is the key. One of the first ways that God renews your mind is having an accurate assessment and view of yourself. You know, before we come to know the Lord, we're pretty impressed with ourselves. (laughs) We are. We're pretty impressed. As you get to know the Lord more in his word, the less impressed you are with him. That's in part how you come to him in the first place. Because you recognize I can't save myself. I'm not doing a good job of running my life. And I need your wisdom, God. I need you to do things your way. But then it continues and you start seeing that apart from him, you, we can do nothing. And that, you know, he talks about, we start reading in his word where he says, don't compare yourselves among yourselves, which isn't wise. And let us consider others better than ourselves. Something that we would never probably think of apart from seeing it in his word. We start preferring our brother. We start seeing how... Um, how that we don't know what we don't know and that's part of being becoming usable for the lord is being less and less impressed with ourselves that's the key to being fruitful in ministry is being less and less and less impressed with yourself and you know that it's only because of god that that you're being used by him <clears throat> so i think it's beautiful to 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 look at this and go he says but to think soberly what does that mean look at look at that verse there that word in that verse, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. It means to, 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 to not be, you know, looking at us inaccurately, but looking at us with a heart of being, um, re, you know, like basically the reality of, of the situation. You know, being humble is not, you know, thinking of low of yourself poorly. It's having an accurate view of yourself. Jesus wasn't being prideful when he said all these amazing things about himself. He was humble, but he could say that because those things were accurate. When we say those things, not necessarily accurate, but he's given each person a measure of faith to trust God, to be able to see things, how God sees those things and use, have God use them as God sees to use them. And we have to have that, that, that perspective, but brokenness happens to be fruitful. You have to be broken. And I don't mean how the world uses it. I'm talking about you're, you're having to be, you know, it comes through unmet expectations and difficulty and hardship. And these things make you more usable and fruitful because you're less impressed with him and you're more dependent upon him versus dependent upon yourself. And he blesses that. So I think that's, I think that's the gist of what the Lord laid on my heart. But it's just a great thing to be able to see that he has this different way of living. And maybe you're here today, you've never given your life to the Lord I want to invite you after the service to come up. I would love to pray with you to begin that relationship with him 
you're not joining this church. There's no way to join this church. You just show up. But we'd love to have you, but God may have a whole different church for you. That's not what I'm getting at. But this is your day to come forward and to receive him. Maybe answer your questions before you're ready to do that. Whatever you need, we're here for you. You know, we're just thankful that God's placed us where he's placed us and, and, and we're here all together as a family. It's a beautiful thing that God's put together and uh, we're just glad that he's using us by his grace. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this. We pray that you would help us to not be conformed any more to this world. Lord, help us to be transformed. We pray that you'd give us a supernatural appetite for your word and to be changed and be made more like you. We're so grateful for your word. We're so grateful for how powerful it is. Lord, I know that you've spoken to us. I know that you've encouraged us. Lord, so thankful for that. I pray, Father, that you would um, continue to speak to us through these verses. We thank you that we get to live a different kind of life and to please you with our lives, Lord. We're so grateful, Lord, that we get to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to you and be volitionally surrendered to you. We thank you for that privilege in Jesus' name. Amen.